Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have a great day so far. Financial service regulations from Asia to Australia to the world panel is all in one must know, covering aspects from driving innovation to creating digital currencies and the latest regulatory developments. Please welcome the moderator, Eugenio, the managing director at Epic Management Consultancy to introduce the panelists. Hi, uh, good afternoon, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Eugenio Congiagioco. I am the MD of uh, APAC Management Consultancy uh, based in Singapore. We offer uh, advice on uh, financial services licenses, executive search m and and so on for this industry. And I will be the moderator for the panel today. It's, um, we have a very nice mix because it's, uh, it's, uh, there is a uh, um, um, financial uh, licenses uh, advisors, let's say regulatory advisors, uh, and representative of uh, a cryptocurrency exchange, uh, CFD broker dealer, and uh, rec tech firms. Um, so it's a very nice mix to discuss the topics of today. Uh, I will invite uh, all of you, starting maybe from Costantinos, to introduce yourself shortly. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Eugene. Um, Costantinos Costantinidis, I'm director at FAI Comply. Um, we sort of do what it says on the box, compliance and legal services for um, CFD industry, but also other services like funds, crypto, PSPs, um, and like Eugene said, the regulatory advisory, basically. Thank you. Uh, Christian Wieder from uh, Head of European Sales at Shifty Pro. Uh, we are a digital identity um, company dealing with anything from an acquiring bank through to an FX broker, um, supplying KYC and email services primarily. Hi, my name's Mark Robinson. Um, I'm from Coinbase. Uh, Coinbase is one of the biggest licensed exchanges around the world. Uh, pleasure to meet you all. Um, uh, my name is Chol, a general manager of uh, Axi in Asia. Um, Axi is a uh, uh, top safety brokerage venue, uh, very active in, in Asia business. Um, hello, my name is Grace, and I head the financial regulatory and TMT practice at a law firm in Singapore, Gibson Dunn. Um, so we do work with quite a lot of exchanges, brokers, um, and we started focusing on this space about seven years ago. So currently we work with and represent about 40 digital asset players in this space. So you can see we are, we are very much uh, really interested in this area and all the exciting developments. Yeah, nice to meet everyone. Thank you all. Um, so I wanted to start from a hot and sensitive topic that is, um, I wanted to ask maybe starting from, from you, if you perceive that there is a, a, a gap, a disconnect between the regulator and the regulated in the sense that uh, um, there is a, um, a, yeah, a, a gap in the, or maybe a lack of understanding sometimes from the regulator on uh, the actual business that they are, uh, they are regulating and how you can overcome these kind of challenges? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I address these questions in a few ways because um, let me explain a bit about my background as well because I actually started off in the Monetary Authority of Singapore and then after that I was in the industry. So very much, you know, having started in the government, I also understand the challenges they have because they are really trying to grapple many different kinds of models and be consistent with the advice which they are giving to the industry. So speaking from a Singapore and Hong Kong perspective, um, definitely there have been a lot of uh, challenges for the regulators because they have had to deal with the Financial Action Task Force guidance. They have had to deal with, you know, making the guidance consistent for a lot of players. There are a lot of delays in Singapore, as some of the um, people here know with regard to licenses. Um, and, and it has been a very hard journey sometimes in convincing the regulator that you have your compliance processes and controls in place. Uh, we worked with four out of 12 of the successful entities so far um, that have obtained licenses in Singapore. Most recently, very happily, one of our clients, after two years, obtained the uh, 
at virtual asset fund management license in Hong Kong. But in that whole journey of working with successful entities and entities who are still queuing up waiting for a license, I think what is important is that you have to be extremely transparent with the regulator, engage, and also be willing to advocate because that is a very important point where working with other players, understanding where the market is, and really making um, advice and, and, and the approach you are um, t undertaking consistent with also the majority of the players and, and really trying to see how you stand out there um, is really very important from a regulatory point of view as well because I've seen that make a difference instead of just pursuing a very vanilla model. Yeah. So I think the regulatory approach is definitely evolving and changing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Mark? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, I've been involved in the, in the crypto side of the industry since 2015. And from the very start, um, dealing with a number of regulators globally, uh, what I think has been very interesting is a lot of the regulators actually want to learn from each other because, especially in this kind of evolving industry, and it's constantly changing, no one has that magic calculation of how do we best regulate this market. And what we're trying to make sure is that we are pro-regulation, but we want to make sure that they're regulating the right things within the industry and they're not over-regulating it or making it overly complex. I think with a product such as crypto, one of the big issues is that it's, it's a global product. And so having differences in regulators across the world is going to further complicate things when you're trying to do cross-border transactions of the same coin, but through different entities. And so we have the, we have the FATF travel rule um, that's coming into place, but even something like that, there's still a lot of inconsistencies about what Europe wants versus the US versus each individual jurisdiction in Asia. Each has their own idea of what needs to be um, provided in terms of details when doing cross-border from exchange to exchange. And so for us, what we want to try and make sure is we work very closely with all of the regulators and try and get some type of consensus so that when the dust does settle and uh, crypto is becoming more mainstream as, a, as an asset type, that it's going to be easier for the clients in general to be able to use this as a transaction tool because right now it's still very, very complicated and we're still seeing some cost inefficiencies because of all of the unique changes we have to do based on each individual regulator. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna reiterate what um, both my peers have said really. Um, you know, you've got, if we're looking at the sort of regulated financial instruments um, industry, if you like, the CFD space has been sort of at the forefront of pushing the retail market, getting that online trading going, allowing for the retail market to trade on platforms which, you know, maybe traditionally platforms were only uh, used by more well-informed investors with DMA access and so on. So, and then hitting the globalization part, like you said, you have local regulators now dealing with online brokers who have a global market um, and who are constantly trying to innovate an enterprise to stay ahead of the game. You know, how do the regulators keep up with that? And how do you balance any knee-jerk reactions from the regulator to ensure that they're not over-regulating anything, having that consultation with them and so on, so that any sort of restrictive measures they put in place or monitoring that they put in place is in line with um, you know, the business practice, but also the compliance behavior that everybody wants to work towards. Eugenio, do you mind if I actually ask Mark a question when you, when you spoke about the, the differences in regulation and, and country-specific regulations? Obviously, you're speaking about crypto. How does like, the regulation in, say, Estonia affect your business in regards to the video ident and the changes that have seen a lot of crypto firms move away from sort of that jurisdiction? Does that have a massive effect on your business? Um, it doesn't have too much of an impact, per se. Um, I mean, for us... We have, we have two different channels of what we can do. We can go down the local licensed entity routes, um, or we can go through the non-entity route um, for certain clients. Um, they still have to provide and do all of the KYC uh, from our internal checks. I mean, we're, we're very strict on what's required on that. And the whole video identity side is also very important. Um, for us, 
as you can imagine, we're, we're onboarding a significant number of clients. And so being able to provide that KYC validation in a timely manner is very important. And so um, smart technology to be able to verify clients' um, IDs that they're providing and also making sure that we're doing uh, follow-ups and checks as well is, is, is key. But for certain jurisdictions where um, they're not so friendly on some of the KYC checks. Um, we will, if, if that client still wants to do business with us, they're still going to have to fulfill our own KYC requirements, which is quite strict. Sorry, I didn't want to, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but no, I appreciate that. Um, so, um, anyone else on this one? Okay, so, um, please. Ah. Yeah, so uh, CFD industry has been more stable then it has a more longer history than the crypto industry. And then the one, one of the major player in this is the CFD industry see these major changes due to the crypto uh, legalizing that the crypto Think is a very interesting, a bit closer. very interesting. At the same time, it's quite challenging uh, uh, the changes in the near future. I have a question for him, actually. So one of the projects which we are working on in Singapore, because um, um, I, I, I sit on, on a group which is called the Virtual Assets Payments Group, and we advocate for digital assets uh, firms um, in front of the MES. So currently, we are working with about 35 people in this specific group looking at regulations for structured products and complex products, and how we differentiate that from simpler products for retail users versus CFD type structured products or futures and more complex products. So I'd love to have your view on um, you know, where, where we actually draw the line for crypto um, across different countries and how you have managed to deal with such challenges. Because I think one of the huge challenges which the group has been struggling with is that they don't want entirely for the securities test to apply because the securities test is actually quite onerous for something like a very fluid uh, product like crypto, which, which has uh, been evolving. Can you explain just shortly for the audience about the security test? Ah, okay. So um, perhaps I'll share a bit from a Singapore and Hong Kong perspective because I cover these two jurisdictions. So in Singapore and Hong Kong, you actually have to, when you want to regard a person as a professional investor, you actually have to have them sign an opt-in form with lots of disclaimers. You have to get a proof of wealth and crypto doesn't count. So even if you have, you know, 50 million in crypto, you're not a professional investor because you're, you're purely looking at property and securities investments and cash in the bank. And, and that test, which has been prevalent and very dominant for, for securities, um, is one which I think a lot of crypto players have been trying to explore whether they can come up with a more fluid test and what it should look like because they want it to be consistent across many jurisdictions. So I'm curious to hear from the CFD firms because this is something which you probably have um, you know, really dealt with given the evolving nature of regulations in, in the CFD space. Yeah, so challenging in the commercial side is that uh, we cannot predict or forecast or estimate or <laughs> foresee what exactly that's the position of the regulator in the next year. Uh, it's, as, we dis as, we, as we talked just before, is it ever evolving? So uh, we wish that it is just one part of asset class, which is no difference from the other asset class. But the reality is that some regulators see this a completely different way. In that way, until that attitude is, uh, that the angle is uh, completely firm, we cannot make a decision. We have, because we have completely two different options to face the market. Um, I, I tend to agree. I mean, we're coming from the sort of European side of things, we are seeing it, it being classified as its own asset under a separate regulation um, the, which came under the AML directive which was published under uh, AML D5. So with that, we're, it's a little bit more straightforward for us because it's already been classified. It's not a financial instrument, there's no sort of security test, there's no retail professional, it's just you have to do uh, your KYC requirements on that. It, there are AML risks to it and that's the registration process. So it's, that's where they sort of draw the line. 
Okay, so earlier uh, Mark used the term that maybe not everyone is familiar with, that is the travel rule. So I was wondering if either you or Mark or both of you can explain a bit better what that means and uh, about the, the so-called sunrise issue and what, 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 what is that uh, specific problem because uh, it's something all across, yeah. Yeah, sure, I can, uh, I, I can take this. So um, to address some of the concerns around uh, being able to track assets that are going um, through different venues and different, uh, different wallets, um, there was a consensus or an agreement to, be, uh, to put in place around uh, travel rules where you have to, as an exchange, be able to exchange certain data or, or client information of that individual that's moving, say, a Bitcoin from venue A to venue B. Um, so that if the authorities want to be able to, to track and trace, um, they can come to the venue and then we can provide them all of the data. And whilst obviously they could still track it from a, from a blockchain address um, and track the journey from A to B, and they, they, there's a number of very strong um, kind of AML companies that we work with that facilitate all of that. However, as an exchange, it's our responsibility to make sure that we're providing certain data um, as part of that transaction when we actually execute that on behalf of the client. The problem is there's no agreed consistency um, in terms of what data do we include. So for example, some, some regulators in Asia um, are asking for quite a, quite a number of uh, details to be included whereas uh, the EU and the US um, are asking for a slightly fewer number of fields. And obviously with, with crypto being this, um, this asset where people want to be able to transact internationally, um, they, they're not so happy about all of their personal data being transferred as part of the trade. So we, we, the, the working groups are still very much in discussion. Um, Europe and the US actually pushed back the implementation of this rule um, until at least 2023. Um, however, some countries in Asia are trying to push it forward faster. But then there's debates about does that really make sense because if it's not a true global implementation, then kind of what's the benefit? And so there, there's a lot of still internal discussions going on and us and our, our uh, competitors, are, we're all working together with the regulators and the committee groups um, to try and get this consensus in place. Um, otherwise, it's, it's just going to get a real mess later on. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I could provide some comments on this as well, because for a while, I think a lot of our clients considered this the number one challenge um, in the licensing process, which only goes to show that this with is, MAS. Yeah. Right. Yes, yes, in dealing with MAS um, in terms of the different types of compliance challenges. So. Um, because we service about, I think for entities applying for license, we were working with about 30 of them. And across these 30, they were all using different types of solutions which connected um, in different sorts of ways, passed on data in a different format. And I think it has become more than a compliance issue. It's also a a, a commercial issue in, in effect because if you are a custodian for instance and you want to service a broad range of clients and, and in turn your, 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 your customers want to service a lot of end users how does your solution that you have adopted interact with them uh, you know do you have different models such that, for example, as a custodian, you may be acting as a custodian to custodize certain assets, but you may also be providing technology for another firm to entirely self-custodize. So there are lots of issues on the travel rule which revolve around um, basically how are you implementing it? Uh, what kind of information are you collecting? How can you verify that you have, that the other party has received information and is protecting it and you are receiving information and you're protecting it? And also the, the last question on, you know, basically to comply with your regulatory obligations in different jurisdictions, 
are you willing to limit yourself commercially because of the expectations of regulators and what does it mean in implementing a global strategy which is cost-friendly at the same time? So this has been extremely challenging. Uh, one of our clients, for example, I don't know how they do it, but they have uh, integrated five travel roof solutions all in one exchange. And you can imagine just how expensive it is to integrate five solutions. And, and they gave me their honest view that none of these five solutions are truly interoperable. So um, in that sense, I think the industry does have more to go forward, but we, we as um, Access, the blockchain association I'm working in, we also try to educate the MES on some of the expectations they throw back at the industry, that these are sometimes um, not practical and you know, there is no technology solution which has resolved the problems that the regulator has, is looking at yet, but we can work with you and signpost what the future could look like. So I think all these are quite important, not to give in so easily, but to also have a dialogue with the regulator. Thank you. Yeah. But in these cases, for example, does the MAS look at what, for example, Europe, Europe is doing? Because I think uh, in, the, I, I don't know, Mark, the, in Europe is not like that, right? For the No, yeah, Europe's not like that at the moment. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Singapore, unfortunately, has the most intense travel rule solution out of all the jurisdictions we have looked at. Um, US, our US clients are sometimes very surprised. <laughs> our Korean clients are also very, very surprised. Um, but um, I think this is just the current stage where Singapore actually headed the group which was looking at the travel rule guidelines and regulations. So I think they really wanted to push forward the best of market um, very early on. And I think there is also a problem of security of this data because, of course, you need to transfer all this data and you are responsible for, for this data. Um, but uh, maybe also a problem of perception uh, because uh, in the end, the, the final clients of the crypto exchange say, hey, what happened to the fact that uh, we were supposed to you know, not be uh, file, put in a, in, in a file and so what's the difference now uh, with, uh, with the normal uh, financial system, right? Um, it's actually the, the industry is the more than welcome that because the travel restriction once it is a fully <laughs> once it is a fully deployed then the crypto will be more dominant more easy to use the in terms of a payment wise transaction wise that is actually the very good signal for that the CFD industry wise uh, only only risk. Uncertainty and uncertainty at this moment is when exactly this will be introduced and then it will dominate, dominate in the market. So, but the, it's actually it's a quite welcome. In that. I, I think the concern is um, the extent to which you as a regulated entity can trust a self-affirmation from another entity. Because I think the majority of solutions I've seen in the market uh, rely on self-affirmation. Um, I know Trust, uh, which is one of the solutions from Coinbase, um, does rely on an audit, but um, you know, I think it's far and few between that all the audits have been completed. So I think we are at this point in time where there is a lot of trust in the industry, but um, indeed, <laughs> um, how much how much the industry can go to actually check that these entities are retaining, storing, transferring data in a proper way that complies with the GDPR and all sorts of requirements. Um, that I'm a bit hesitant at the moment at the state of maturity of the industry, but I think this is front and centre and there have been data principles issued for travel rule providers by one of the industry players, the Global Digital Finance. Yeah. One thing, if I'm not wrong, but at least the one part where everyone agreed is the protocol to transfer the message that is the I call I, IVMS 101. So, yeah, yeah, at least one thing uh, that is standardized so is, is a first step. Well, I think MES wants lots of additional things. So the IVMS 101 is the messaging standard. I don't know whether many of you are familiar with Swift. So think about it as Swift for um, digital assets, and that's the way you're looking at it. But there's a lot of... Um, Sidelines, uh, because the, the Fed F says that if you are tran doing transfers between unhosted wallets, um, this is uh, this might constitute uh, an area of greater risk. So, in the context of Singapore, uh, there's a lot of added requirements on Satoshi test, which is you sending a small value to the other party, a one-way Satoshi test, or two-way, and then sending it back. Some officers in the MAS believe in a two-way, some believe in a one-way. You know, it's it's really a very variation of approach sometimes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. This was a very long explanation Apologies. of what the travel rule is. I shall <laughs> let the rest speak. Apologies. <laughs> okay.
Um, so I wanted to um, change to um, another topic that is, I think, is becoming more and more important uh, for both uh, brokers and cryptocurrency exchange and all financial services provider. That is the fact about uh, um, trying to make it easier about onboarding the clients. So um, there are now more and more companies providing these uh, so-called EKYC um, solutions. So um, it is um, definitely useful uh, for everyone, for all the operators. One question that uh, I think remains open is uh, the fact that uh, sometimes the brokers do not know when uh, they use one provider if uh, and to which extent they can feel comfortable that they are complying with the law to the extent that some people have proposed, okay, what if this uh, rec tech companies, not just for EKYC, but also, for example, for reporting, they are actually regulated to some extent uh, by, the, by, the, um, uh, by the regulators and, uh, and or put in a sandbox or kind of simply registered or verified or audited anything so that uh, the user is, uh, uh, the, the broker knows that at least the regulator know what's happening and they don't have to worry about that. Of course, on one side, this would uh, increase the cost but uh, also the certainty. So I wanted to ask, uh, of course, yeah, Kristen. Yeah, uh, for us, I think we would welcome that. I think as long as you're picking the right provider, um, you know, there's, uh, with, with any industry, with any service provider, there's, you know, their, their pros and cons and what they can offer and, you know, you know, data sources that they can offer and verification that they can offer. But I think us as a company would welcome it. I think because, you know, for me, with, you know, if modern EKYC, there shouldn't be any real pushback from, you know, any, any compliance problems. You know, if you're combining, you know, document verification with, you know, real-time biometrics and then, you know, pushing other data sources around that, then for me, that's probably one of the safest ways that you can onboard uh, a client. You know, if you look at old school manual onboarding, you know, teams work in silos. It's a very long process. You know, there can be mistakes in that onboarding process. To me, you know, as I say, definitely for us, that'd be something that we would welcome. But do you see something that was, there is any conversation ongoing with any authority about this? No, I, I don't see that happening to, to Mark's point about crypto. I think the, you always see different uh, requirements for each region and getting that to be sort of one global point of view, I don't think will happen. Um, and it all comes down to the area of business. Me and Mark were talking before, you know, if you, we work with anything from an acquiring bank through to a crypto exchange. If you look at an acquiring bank, they might run 12 different layers of data. You know, they want pre-screening, they want email verification, they want SIM background checks, they want, you know, EID. There's a, there's a whole different level of, of data requirements. If you work with you know, an FX or a crypto broker, they might just want a, a document verification and an AML you know, PEP sanctions check. So the compliance requirements is always driven by, the, by the, the, the company. And that also might come down by you know, region requirements. And, and ultimately, it comes down sometimes to the, the budget that they want to spend. So I can't see it getting to that point where we have one rule for all, because to your point, you know, per spend, an FX broker, for instance, doesn't want to spend the same amount per person on, say, an acquiring bank onboarding that individual. So I, it might be that there's, there's certain tick boxes that everyone has to dump, but in regards to a whole sweep of, I can't see us getting to that point yet. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. Um, I think sort of regulators have a, uh, quite a lot on their plate already. If you're going to be adding reg tech under it's a relatively big banner. I mean, generally, RegTech has been quite on the back office side of things. You see it coming on the front office side of things now as well with AIs and call monitoring and so on. So you need to sort of appreciate like, where do we draw the line on where RegTech would start and stop. Um, and I, I think uh, what Christian said is, is perfect. It, it is more of a B2B maybe standardization, a bit of an education process where everybody understands that, okay, Let's have a few tick boxes in place. Let's get an association going where you can say, these are the guidelines. They have to have ISO certification or um, things like that, for example. And then have your peers sort of put that guideline in place. Uh, that would be my sort of point of view of how to move the things forward, really. Thank you. 
One, one thing I would say, um, kind of taking a slightly different stance, is I mean, there's some wonderful EKYC products out there in the market now. And so I think if, you, like, uh, my, I was in the banking uh, industry um, for over 20 years, and so I remember the, the good old days of uh, the process it took to just do some type of uh, verification. Now with, like, new technologies, new providers, and doing the EKYC process, even though it's still a little bit like troublesome for, for different firms to, to have to jump through that hoop, the, the amount of resources as a company you need to allocate to do this EKYC has dropped dramatically now. And so you are, like technology is providing this type of efficiency and even, like, even, even if a client wants to onboard, whether it's a retail or institutional type client, we have different KYC processes that need to be done depending on the clients, obviously. But nonetheless, if we're looking at, say, a retail client and they want to set up an account with us, it's a very, very seamless process now. They don't need to know what goes on behind the scenes in terms of all of the background verification that we do. And we still do multiple 2FA type uh, verification with regards to the type of documents that they're sending. But nonetheless, you, you look at even, say, 10 years ago, um, the technology then was very different to what it is now. And I, I think um, as, as the industry involves as, and as uh, a, lot of, a lot of the verification firms continue to invest in technology, the process is going to continue to evolve as well, which I think will in turn also help the regulators. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with that. And, and to, to Mark's point, that is really our, or, or players in our space, that's our sort of go to market you know if you if you take a just a traditional manual process that maybe takes you know a, a week days hours you know we're looking to bring that down to you know 6 seconds you know we're looking to do a document facial verification 6 seconds which allows you know more time to do you know ongoing monitoring or or further checks in the background so my point was more there's a, there's a whole lot more technology out there to assist you. I just don't know where we get to in regards to formulate that consistently across every vertical. Thank you. Uh, yes, compared to five years ago, uh, there has been really massive improvements I could see in the EKYC. The steel is not perfect, so especially for many countries in Asia. Uh, but the, compared to, again, the, the four or five years ago, the amount of resource required to go through or amount of resource to uh, complete that, that, the whole process is dramatically changed. It's still there, still there. But the, I think for the next two, three years, uh, it will be completely automated uh, in, in, in most of the country available in the market. Um, I'll briefly just add two points on that. So I think it definitely has been more advanced on the retail customer front, but on the corporate customer front and quite a number of our clients uh, focus on the institutional market, there's still a lot of uh, challenge sometimes with um, corporate documents because you have to convince the other party to get you connected party documents, ultimate beneficial owner documents. There's no local jurisdiction corporate repo. You have to check and verify documents for which there's no general database to do that scan against because you need data to, to you know, machine learn data, right? Um, so all these that are challenges that remain in the corporate institutional front, uh, particularly with sanctions, we saw a lot of these issues come to fore because there was a lot more sensitivity about transactions, about how, um, how funds were flowing between different countries, for what purpose, what business the other entity was involved in. So that's the first point I would note um, in, 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 in implementing Implementing RegTech. Um, the second point I'll, I'll note very briefly is uh, operational resilience. So, um in light of COVID, we really saw this come to fore. Um, I think starting from the EU, we started seeing um, DORA, which uh, what was one of the huge regulations in the EU focusing on operation resilience and security. And I think sometimes when you're working with an external service provider, um, you see it as meeting Let's your solution. Let's define operational resilience. Okay. Yes, very fast, yes. But I think the difficulty is that sometimes for security issues, having a third-party access point or thinking about outsourcing requirements, that is the tricky part where our clients actually struggle with, notwithstanding that solutions really help them to a large extent.
Yeah, so completely agree with your first point that the KYB is uh, never automation and then now it's becoming more and more dangerous because of the whole distinction between that the international geopolitical issue and the money laundering at the higher level of the AML tolerance. So that part is a completely exemption, a completely different, completely different world from the EKYC world. Yeah, so um, on this point, there is also the fact that there is no standardized list of countries for the brokers in the sense that uh, um, even different uh, financial services providers from the same country, licensed by the same regulator, they, um, the, the, the compliance officer usually have each country, each uh, company has a different list of uh, uh, countries they can onboard from because everything is still kind of based on principles. And, uh, but this, of course, creates uh, challenges. So do you think that there is any way at all, um, I mean, this is also for you, to standardize something like that? Because there are even, even without, even li leaving aside the retail, even I see sometimes liquidity providers, they show me where they can onboard the clients from, and I see stuff that is very, very inconsistent. So to, to both your points, there's no silver bullet for KYB, uh, and normally, you know, the, the businesses that are domiciled in certain countries are there because they don't want you to find that information. So it's always a mix between, the, that's just my personal, uh, you know, the, it's always a, a big mix between the, the KYB and KYC. Sometimes you can expedite and speed up the KYC part, but the KYB part is always going to be a venue, manual process. And going back to, to vendors in that space, it's a very different offering of, you know, where they can get the information, what, what uh, servers they're plugged into, how deep they can go, how much, you know, how much they can really dig deep into that family tree and dig up the, the beneficial owners, the UBOs, how those companies are linked. So I think that's something that's, that's really difficult. And as I say, for me, it's always a combination of, you know, pre-screening those, those KYC applicants and then obviously moving on to the KYB and then back to the KYC. So it's difficult. I don't, again, I don't think we'll ever get to a standardized uh, point for the business because, you know, again, every business is so different, but you just have to try and do the, the best you can. And then, you know, sometimes velocity check those clients. So make sure that, you know, you're, you're doing continuous monitoring. You've got a good transaction monitoring solution in place. It's about, you know, creating that that end to end sort of overview of, of, of the individual and the business as you can. In, in, in Europe, we've seen some sort of developments with um, the UBO directive coming in, which has required, sort of, you know, across Europe, all UBOs to be declared and registered on a, you know, a platform which is accessible not to the public yet, but um, to other governments and to, sorry, uh, so the UBO directive has allowed, um, it's required all UBOs to be declared, not publicly yet, but intergovernmental and so on. So. There is a push to get there, but as Christian very correctly said, you know, if you're looking at an offshore jurisdiction which has no requirement to look at any of that, it's very difficult to standardize it. Thank you. Um, we see more and more that um, there are like crypto exchanges, crypto operators in general that uh, start looking into uh, Forex CFDs um, activity and vice versa, Forex and CFD providers that try to look more into, um, let's say, physical, let's if, allow me the term um, cryptocurrency trading. So there has been emerging and that could be a good thing and a bad thing. But from regulatory point of view, I think this creates challenges, not just with the regulators, but also in terms of relationships with the providers of the group. So if a group, for example, is dealing in uh, Forex and CFDs and has relationship with, uh, um, um, with the liquidity providers or payment service providers that have a certain risk threshold and they are willing to deal with a Forex broker but not with a crypto broker, then this might create some challenges. So it opens the question on whether a group should completely, let's say, segregate the two activities may be down to the brand, or if it is okay to just operate everything under one brand and maybe even cross-sell to each other, and yeah. So what, what are your thoughts on this? I think, um, well, obviously from a branding perspective, people want things under one brand. It doesn't really make sense to 
to, to double up you know on brands and then uh, sell and so on uh, but I think the the biggest problem we're seeing at least from our side of the pond if you like um, is um, e banks e PSPs EMIs as soon as they see crypto it's a red flag in many cases we've seen it just shut down accounts so to that level. So the, the, the scrutiny that you touched on is, is very much real. So how are we seeing firms deal with that? It's very much moving away from having the PSP relationships, the banking relationships, the liquidity provider relationships um, in an admi administrative fashion. So it's about deploying sort of payment teams that you're not your traditional back office payment teams, but payment teams which are constantly looking for PSPs, constantly approaching banks, uh, and making the whole payments environment part of your strategy rather than a sort of administrative process you have in the background because it's the foundation now. Without the money coming in, you can't provide the service. Yeah, that, that's the biggest sort of risk we're seeing. Thank you. Well, what I, what I kind of find interesting through uh i mean i've been in crypto for a while now and uh this this particular area never gets easier with regards to bank account setups and uh trying to trying to get these accounts because as soon as you mention the word crypto suddenly they like the door shuts down right in front of your face um but what what i also think is interesting is a lot of these firms that you would traditionally go to to have that banking relationship they're quite public in terms of they're actually doing some crypto related stuff as well. So it's kind of to me a little bit ironic how certain firms, no mentioning any names, are saying that they're, they're starting to do say crypto custody or crypto exchange even. Um, yet when you actually speak to them about, okay, well, I'd like to set up a, a, an account for, for our company, they kind of look at you and say, oh no, we, we, we don't do crypto. So. I think there's also like internal conflict with like some of these bigger organizations as well, where they, they see the value of having this as an alternate asset type for trading uh, for their clients, and their clients are asking for it. I mean, some of these big traditional firms are kind of, they're doing this because their clients are saying, look, if you don't offer it, I'm gonna go to someone else that is. And uh, I mean, I think like for, for us, like at Coinbase, I think the, the BlackRock deal that was announced um, a few weeks ago is a, is a huge kind of nod to the industry in terms of them integrating our product into their Aladdin platform will allow their clients to have direct access into crypto. Yet, some of these other traditional firms that are also looking into this space are still trying to be somewhat reluctant when it comes to the more standardized things like account setups, even though we're more than happy to obviously go through all of the checks that you would need to do. Um, they, they still, as soon as you mention the word crypto, kind of put, put, put the gate down. Thank you. Yeah, I see there will be a major consolidation in this two uh, industry becoming closer, becoming more and more closer to each other. Uh, it'll be good news for the winner it would be the really bad news for the loser in the end. Uh, currently, I can see that the many CFT brokers doesn't, the broker don't have a very clear answer what to do uh, in this business opportunity or major threat which can kill them in the end, uh, possibly. Uh, so we will see that the which, who can get this opportunity as uh, for, for their business, and then who will lose that business opportunity. I cannot tell full detail, but the many things, so many detailed discussion about uh, what is the best use of this, this opportunity into the payment system, into the KYC, into that the partnership, into that the competition. So, so many discussion is undergoing. But the one thing for sure is that the, you can see that the major winners and the major lunar, uh, losers in the near future. That's for sure. Oh, I'll briefly note that I think regulation is a double-edged sword. It can be a challenge, but it can also be an opportunity. So I think some of our derivatives clients, um, those that are also involved in 
crypto CFDs, for instance, they have always been quite surprised about Singapore as a jurisdiction because even though Singapore is so um, onerous in terms of regulating um, exchanges, brokers that deal in spot, um, crypto derivatives is actually an unregulated product um, unless it is traded on one of the four approved exchanges. So ironically, we do see all kinds of models where they do a lot of um, regulations on the regulated entity and then they park crypto derivatives to be offered by a sister entity which may be another entity in Singapore or offshore and they develop very different types of protocols on, by that other entity. Um, I think even some of the licensed entities have started going by that path. But once again, this could be all upset by the regulator changing their mind the very next month. So I think that's why I, I always say, you know, you have to tweak and understand the regulations in a, quite a large extent on detail because it can truly be a business opportunity if you structure it well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have another question, but since we have only a minute left, I just wanted to check if anyone had uh, any question from the public. Hopefully not from regulators. I hope no one got offended today. Okay, no question. So, um, thank you. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Good evening. Okay. Uh, my name is Dr. Shazwan from Malaysia. We represent a capital wealth uh, management company. So I agree with what Mark said and what Grace said just now regarding regulations and the banks getting involved. But uh, we have a huge issue with taxation now in Malaysia. So maybe some insight, because usually Malaysia or I think Singapore, it's very different. But Malaysia usually will try to follow what was already done by the EU or by other regulatories. So maybe just give me an insight of how the taxation works in terms of the uh, intrinsic value and in terms of the margin trading profits that we get. In gather. Singapore? In Malaysia. In Malaysia. No, no, I mean an overall value of what's happening on, on your side. Because on our side, we don't really have any um, fixed uh, regulation now in terms of taxation. Thank you. So I, I, I don't have a direct answer on that. Um, I would say some of the, some of the challenges that we, that we face in terms of the different taxation rules around the world and how different countries tax different uh, crypto assets um, what, what we've had to do um, and some of it's being regulatory driven um, especially in countries like Japan where they've mandated that as an exchange you have to be able to provide um, a tax calculation uh, methodology as part of the, uh, the, the user dashboard so that when it comes to tax time um, clients have that facility um, readily available for them. I think that that hasn't necessarily filtered down to the institutional side. That's more on the retail side to date. Um, however, I, I don't know how much of a stretch it would be to try and implement something like that on the exchange side. I think it's going to have to be more on the broker side because depending on depending on their jurisdictions, depending on how they do the trade internally through their own books as well. There, there could be a number of different methodologies that they could use to get different tax outcomes. Thank you, thank you. So at this the end of the session, so I hope that it was uh, informative for everyone. Thank you to all the speakers and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.